Hey, hey, what is going on? I'm on my way to Ghost Ranch, New Mexico to take a look at some awesome fossils and stratigraphy. Um, but as I was driving, I saw this incredible outcrop in a road cut on this side of the road. So I thought, you know, you can't let a good outcrop go to waste. Let's take a stop. Let's walk our way through it and see what we see. It's a pretty interesting, it looks like a Triassic through Jurassic succession uh, with a variety of facies. Looks like there's some fluvial stuff maybe. It looked like there's some channels I was seeing, some channel scours and bodies. Um, I don't know. I thought we would just kind of start at the bottom and work our way up and see what we see before I continue on to Ghost Ranch. It's always good for a laugh. Why not, right? But before diving in and starting to make interpretations on the rock, it's always good to step back and familiarize yourselves with the stratigraphy. So let's do that here. This lower brick red unit is the Cutler group. It's a Permian unit that's generally interpreted as being Sabka and distal alluvial plain that transitions into the Chinle group. And the Chinle has a variety of formations. We're not going to get into that right now because there's a whole bunch of formations and members. But the important thing to know about it is it's a coarse grained fluvial channel deposit system here in the bottom. And it also has some finer grained siltstone and mudstone members. Uh, most of the fossils are found in the fine grain material, but these coarse grain channel bodies have some really interesting stories to tell about the local landscape and paleogeography at the time of accumulation. So we're going to pull over and take a look at them in a little bit more detail once we get through the top here. I just want to continue driving and show you guys that once we get to the top, we sort of open up into this big grassy plain. All right, enough of this. Let's get to it. I gotta keep looking around because there's fair amount of traffic here on the road and there's not much of a shoulder to walk on. So if you're gonna do this, be very careful. Or better yet, just watch this video. That way you don't have to. Oh yeah. Take a look at this. Here we are in the basal part of our section and it says really red, fairly well laminated material. And that lamination can mean a couple of things. Usually it's associated with standing water, either a lake or a bay or an ocean or something like that. Uh, it's not too common to find that in floodplains. Usually it's all stomped on by animals and rooted by plants. So that tends to look like something that was deposited maybe in standing water. The other possibility is the frontal splay of a dry land delta system, uh, something like the Okavango Delta or Lake Eyre in Australia, where you get these big frontal splays off the river mouths. But it looks suspiciously non floodplainy non-foresty and then it kind of progrades up into sandier material and that sandier material carries over which looks in a way it looks like you're starting to see some scours see that there's a basal scour in that channel body I'm calling it a channel body it might not be a channel body i'm just saying it looks like it's scouring down and removing some of the sediment and look at that first sand above the red bed it's got a shape that looks like it's scouring down into the underlying material. So that's pretty typical of fluvial systems, river channels. Um, you know, I know this area is interpreted as being pretty dry land back in the late Triassic and Jurassic. So you wouldn't expect necessarily a lot of forests and plants. That might be what we're seeing here is the results of dry land fluvial systems that were dumping frontal splays in front of them and then the little channels came in um, and scoured out their frontal splay systems. I should point out that climate changed back in the Triassic, just like it does today. So we know that later in the Triassic, the climate actually got a lot wetter and there were big forests. You might have heard of the petrified forest in Arizona with its giant fossil logs. So it's important to remember that climate was exerting an influence on the sediments. And then it looks like you got a change up above yeah, and a lot of traffic. Did I mention the traffic? Let's work our way back up, see if we can pick out some other features that give us a clue about the environment, maybe even the age. Here's a little bit better view of that first candidate channel body. It's very small and very shallow. It's probably not more than about a meter thick, three feet thick. And that's typical of these terminal channels on dry land systems like the Okavango, which is a river system in Botswana that actually feeds a landlocked delta. 
And as you go downstream, the river channels get smaller and smaller and shallower and shallower. So that's consistent with what we're seeing. And that reddish color, again, is typical of subaerial exposure. So we're not necessarily looking at something submarine or subaqueous. So that suggests that we are seeing a dry land frontal splay system along with the distributary channels, or actually technically they're distributive channels, not distributary. Um, let's take a moment and talk about that actually. It seems really subtle and maybe unimportant, but there's a huge difference between distributary and distributive channels. Distributary channels are typical of deltas, and that means they're all simultaneously active, dumping water and sediment at the same time. Whereas distributive channels are typical of fluvial systems, and usually only one or a couple of them are active at any given time, and the rest are abandoned. And they're the most common fluvial systems in the rock record, and they're typically abbreviated as DFS because it's too hard to say distributive fluvial system. Um, the other type of fluvial deposit in the rock record is incised valleys, but they're not as common and we're not seeing any evidence of valley incision or any features typical of them in this outcrop. And even when we do see a big change in color and maybe lithology, for example, from the purple below to the gray and gold of sandstone above, it's not accompanied by a big incision event like you'd expect in a valley, just a shallow channel scour like the rest. But to be sure, we need to get a closer look at the rocks, so we'll run across the road in a second. But first, let's take a moment to look at the architecture, and by that I just mean what the beds of sandstone are doing, and you can really see those nice little scours and incisions that convince you we really are seeing a fluvial channel system, in other words, river deposits. But this other part of the outcrop looks more blocky, it looks more homogenous, so I think it'll be worthwhile to take a look at it. There's also some interesting chatter going on there. It looks like it might be some fractures and faulting. So getting across the street and you see there's this recessive package. In other words, it's better eroded than the overlying sand. And that makes you think that it's probably a mudstone or a siltstone. Look at the sand. That is super coarse though. There's pebbles, there's cobbles, it's coarse grain sand and it sits on a scour in this recessive, what looks like mudstone or siltstone. And of course, the best way to tell is to chew it. So, Now this coarse grain sandstone is really interesting because it's suggesting that we're not terribly far from the source. In other words, there's uplifted mountains somewhere nearby, and the most likely candidate is the ancestral Rockies that were active here since the Pennsylvania and Permian. And these mint green streaks and little lineations are fossil root traces or rhizoliths telling us that we're in the floodplain adjacent to the channel. Now, why am I calling it a channel body or a fluvial channel? Well, let's take a look at the internal sedimentology here. See this, this is cross bedding and it looks like trough cross bedding, maybe some planar trough cross bedding and it's all oriented that direction. So to the west, there's some scours in here uh, but there's also cross bedding going in opposite directions. So it kind of looks like, see, there's some dipping down to the west. You see some maybe coming to the east. So there's variable orientation, which is typical in a high sinuosity river system. And there's that basal scour of the sandstone. So we've got a scour with cross bedded sand kind of going different directions, typical of a channel. It's kind of winding back and forth, meandering, you might say. In fact, I just said it, and this is probably a coarse grain meandering channel. So taking a look a little bit closer at the top of the sand, look at this. This is what we would consider overbank material. It's finer grained, it's silty and sandy, and it has this nodular appearance because of all the roots and burrows, big things like crawfish burrows and some beetle burrows, typical of an overbank. There's also this reddish color, which as I mentioned before, is due to oxidation, subaerial oxidation. So it's been sitting under the air on the floodplain for a long period of time while it gets burrowed and rooted. And contrast that with the underlying channel body, which is still pretty much sand colored. And talking about sand color, let's take a look at the next channel body above us. And this is really pretty typical. Look at that sharp contact between the underlying overbank material, which is kind of grayish and pink, and that really nice conglomeratic sandstone channel body. Taking a look close to it, these are some pretty big pebbles. Uh, this is, again, typical of something that's pretty close to its source. So we're in a fluvial system not far from the source terrain, the uplifted mountains cutting into its overbank, which is that silty, it's kind of sandy, silty material, typical of a dry land or arid system, or at least strongly seasonal 
fluvial system like we see in monsoonal parts of the world. And we don't see any coals or carbonaceous shales or anything else that makes us think there's a high water table or standing lakes or ponds. And because basin subsidence was not rapid enough to capture all the channel bodies and their associated floodplains, the result was channels meandering back and forth tended to erode and remove older floodplain deposits, leading to this big amalgamated sheet of sand. The few bits of floodplain that are preserved might be in either abandoned channels that were then filled in during subsequent floods, or there might just be little remnants of a floodplain, but there's not consistent big piles of it. And for fans of structural geology, take a look at this nice little normal fault offsetting the strata on either side. It might be easy to mistake this for a channel scour or something stratigraphic, but taking a look at the deposits under and over the channel body convinces you that everything really is offset because of the fault. And it's a normal fault, meaning everything on the left side is down dropped relative to strata on the right. Okay, let's get back to stratigraphy. You know, I always say context is everything and it's true. So let's take a moment and talk about the paleogeography of this area during the Permian and the Triassic. We'll start with the uplifts because that's the origin of the rivers and their sediment. And paleogeographic maps reveal that there are a series of northwest to southeast trending mountain belts, the ancestral Rockies, that were active during the Permian and feeding sediment into the basins. So our distal fluvial or playa section of the Permian Cutler group was deposited in a setting something like this, uh, although I might put the mountains in a little bit slightly different position. And our very coarse-grained fluvial chinley section was deposited in a setting something like this. And in fact, it represents the last gasp of the ancestral Rockies before they went quiet during the Jurassic. So this is a pretty exciting section. <laughs> I'd buy that for a dollar. All right, so there you have it, my 15-minute interpretation of this outcrop. We can see there's a general change from the red, horizontally laminated, maybe lacustrine, maybe frontal splays of river deposits, to by the time we're in the really coarse grained, I mean, pebbles, cobbles, and uh, <laughs> people love geology. Um, you see some coarse grain fluvial bars and channel bodies going up into floodplain deposits with models and possibly burrows and insects, then more channels. I hope you enjoyed this little diversion. And now I'm gonna get back to Ghost Ranch because we got some really cool stuff to see there. As always, thanks for watching and I will see you on the outcrop.